Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Emily Garfinkel. I am the Membership and Programs Manager here at the Connecticut League of Museums. Um, I am also joined here by our Executive Director, Amaris Williams, um, as well as the Grant Staff at Connecticut Humanities. We have Scott Wands, Leanne Partridge, and Becky Viskauskets with us. I give a little wave over there. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And of course, thank Connecticut Humanities for offering this program to our audience today. Um, this is part two um, in a grant series that we are doing. Um, this is a sequel to the past program, the introduction to uh, Connecticut Humanities Grants. And today will be um, more of a hands-on sort of workshop uh, grant writing 101 format program. Um, so I won't take too long, but just a few housekeeping things. Um, we do have everybody muted just because we are expecting a larger audience today. Um, so uh, just to keep the run of show going smoothly. Um, like I said, this program will be recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you need to duck out early, not to worry. Um, it will be sent in a follow-up email to everybody registered, um, as well as some of the resources um, from today. I will also send along the recording from last time in case you weren't able to make it um, so you can catch up there as well. Um, as far as questions goes, um, we ask that if you do have questions during the program, please drop them in our chat um, and we will be queuing them up at the end. So we will reserve time at the end to um, address some of those questions the best we can, um, but you can put them there for now. So without further ado, I will pass it over to CTH and uh, take it away, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Amherst, for hosting us again today, and thank you all for, for joining us. So as, as Emily noted, this is the second uh, of two workshops that we did. The last workshop was more talking about what Connecticut Humanities grant lines are and walking through them a little bit more and what our funding priorities are. We're not going to do as much of that today. Um, this is more to help all of you um, be better grant writers, be better grant writers for us at Connecticut Humanities or for other funders as well. And uh, myself, Leanne and Becky will kind of go back and forth through the slides, giving different tips and suggestions that we have, uh, what we've seen from uh, grants that have come through us here at Connecticut Humanities, and we are leaving ample time at the end. So do put your questions in the chat, as Emily said, um, and we'll take some live questions at the end as well. All right. so. We do have a wide variety of grant lines here at Connecticut Humanities. Um, like I said, I won't talk more about them, but just in general, we have project grants like quick grants, um, planning and implementation, sponsorships and capacity grants. You can go to our website, cthumanities.org slash grants, and there's a handy chart there that'll help tell you about the different project grant lines that we have, some key information about them, and then you can click through for more, including um, sample grant model applications to use. Um, and again, we're not jumping heavily into our priorities today, but just want to reiterate that we give priority across all of our project grant lines for projects that have strong humanities scholarship and content and explore those topics in inclusive, diverse, and equitable manners and do one or more of the following. So we want all of our projects to have good scholarship and be inclusive and equitable. Um, and then if your project could help us understand the issues going on in society today, are doing things that are creative and innovative, uh, inspiring your audience to um, be provoked or, or think about things differently after having attended, um, have access to your content in various ways after the project ends, or collaborative. Again, you don't have to hit all of those, but these are ways to have a stronger, uh, more competitive grant in our review process. Um, overall, on our website, you can go uh, and see our grant application process. Um, but just to highlight quickly here what goes through here, uh, you have a grant idea, we encourage you to email grants at cthumanities.org. We will set up a consultation with you about your project. We want to make sure that um, before you spend a lot of time on an application, uh, you are having a competitive project and are applying for the right grant line at Connecticut Humanities. Um, if you save an application in our system at least uh, two weeks before the most deadlines, we will be able to do a draft review and give you feedback so you'll have the most competitive application possible. Um, after submission, your grant will go to a review and we've got um, an application review committee, which is composed of board members and outside subject area experts. Their recommendations go to our full board for recommendations for funding. And then we will notify everyone about their grant status, whether they're funded or not, both via email and through um, a, a phone call so we can let you know um, if you're funded, what some suggestions that the committee might have had for your project, and if you were not funded, uh, what some of the, the reasons are. 
So one of the key things to remember is that grant officers are your friend. We are here to help you. Our job is um, to help you have the most competitive application possible and really help you try to be successful. Um, so to start, um, you really want to learn about the funder, what types of grants they offer and what their priorities are, um, which is part of why Scott read our priorities out loud for you at the beginning, those are really key to know about any funder that you're looking to work with. Um, reach out early, as early as you have an idea. Connecticut Humanities does require a consult, as Scott described, um, but it's good to do that with any funder that you're looking um, to apply to. Um, introduce yourself, your organization, your project idea, help them get to know you, your organization, and what it is you're looking to do, what you're looking to accomplish, what problem you're hoping to solve. Um, set up a time to connect. Again, that would be a consult with us. Um, other organizations, other funders might have their own other uh, requirements. Um, and prepare any questions that you might have in advance. And always ask, is there anything that I should ask that I haven't asked yet? Um, we have our key points that we like to go over, but it's always helpful to ask and to prompt us. Um, there might be um, some common questions, especially once we know your project a little bit better, um, that we might be able to point you in the, the right direction. Um, and take advantage of any resources and help that your grant officers um, offer, like that draft review that Scott was mentioning earlier. That's why you want to get to us early, so that you can take advantage of all those different resources. And we are your friend at the bottom there. We are not the ones making decisions on the grants. We are the ones trying to make everyone happy and make the best decisions possible. So one of our recommendations um, for people who are new to an organization or new, especially new to grant writing in general, is to start small. It's not required, but we do recommend it. Um, start with something that is an easier to achieve project, maybe something with a smaller budget to manage. Um, you want to create that relationship with the funder, get to know each other so that Beyond that consult, they get to know you even better and some of your broader goals, your mission, um, and just how you're serving your community. Once you've successfully co completed a smaller grant, then we recommend working towards a larger grant. Um, so for us, that would be starting with something like a sponsorship or a quick grant. And then once you've successfully completed that, working towards one of our, what we call major grants, capacity planning or implementation. This sounds very simple, but read the guidelines. We put these out there to help you and to answer the kind of questions that you have and to answer all the specifics there. So even before you um, reach out to a grant officer, if you know you're applying to a, a certain grant line, read those guidelines. A lot of the questions you have are probably going to be answered right there, and then you can focus your questions on the things that you're not seeing or on um, you know, questions about some of the specific parts of the guidelines. But don't just read it once. You know, When you're done with the application and before you submit, go back and read it again. Um, oftentimes you're gonna figure out that there were some funding exclusions maybe of some of the stuff that you had put in there for funding and you could switch it to something else um, once you realize that that's the case. Um, you know, It's especially important to make sure that that project budget you submitted doesn't request funds for those ineligible objects. Um, you know, For us at Connecticut Humanities, one example is we cannot pay for food or beverage and refreshments and meals. And we know that a lot of the programs that we fund have those as a reception afterwards, or if you're doing a long yeah. doing a lunch in the middle of it, um, you can use that as your match. But if it came into us for a, a portion of the funding you're requesting, we're going to have to not fund that part. And rather than have a maximum grant award for a great project, you'll have to have a, a, a project that cuts that out. And we can cover those things and, and deal with them ahead of time, especially if everyone has read the guidelines and looked at those things ahead of time. All right, so um, another thing that sounds obvious but is really, really important is planning ahead. So we recommend planning ahead not only for your project, knowing what you um, expect within your project itself, but also looking at the grant deadlines for the grants that you're going to be applying for, whether it's through us or through other organizations. So it's really important to have timelines for your projects, even if you're thinking about a project idea, at least knowing generally what time of year you might be looking um, to have that project because then you'll be able to work backwards and find when are the right grant deadlines, or at least we can help you as grants officers um, talk about when are the right deadlines to target. You, you might have multiple opportunities. There might be one right around the corner that's your only opportunity. And so that that's really important. And ideally, if you're able to identify in enough time when your project is, you can work backwards looking at what other resources um, the, grant, the grantor might have available for example, um, we might have draft reviews like CTH does, or there might be um, the opportunity to discuss and to consult 
And so working backwards, make sure that you have enough time to take advantage of all of those resources. So know when the deadlines are, when notification happens, when the fundable project period window is, and when you want to apply for your next grant. Most of this information for most funders is going to be on their website and their guidelines. So again, it's really important to be familiar with those guidelines. Um, and then also knowing an idea at least of your budget. So again, when you reach out to a grantor, it's really helpful if you know ex generally what your project is going to cost, what you want to request for, and if the grant requires match like our grants do, what your match might be. That's something a grant officer can help walk you through, um, but it's really helpful if you have that information planned ahead to discuss. Now, overall, this is something that's important. We get a lot of grants that do maybe part of things well, but not a full thing. By that, I mean a successful grant will be both descriptive and persuasive. You need to tell us why your project matters, and you're going to be in a competitive round, especially for quick grant sponsorships, planning, implementation. Um, for quick grants, we could have 20, 25 grants in a round. So you need to help us understand why your project matters and why we should be funding it. But you also need to be giving us the details about that project. When does your exhibit take place? Where does it take place? If you're doing a program series, who are your presenters? What are they going to be talking about? Sometimes we have, like I said, things that do part of it well, they, they make their case really well, and then there's a whole lot of questions because we didn't get all those details and description in. Or the, the opposite, we've got all the detail and description, but no one really explained to our committee why it matters. Those grants that do both are the ones that inevitably get higher scores and will end up in uh, more likely to be in the funding range for, for that round of grants. So another recommendation we have is to think about grants from the reviewer's perspective. Most grants are competitive like our grants are. And so helping to think, think from the reviewer's perspective really helps you to see how competitive you can make your um, application. Depending on the grant line and the deadline, um, a reviewer for Connecticut Humanities typically reads between 10 to 30 applications. So in a really competitive round, you might be competing against a lot of applications for a limited pool of funding. What can you do to really highlight your project to the reviewers, make yourself stand out? And what do you think reviewers might really want to know about your project? So thinking from the reviewer's perspective, you might ask yourself, what would you want to know if you are responsible for stewarding funds? What type of information would make you feel confident in your decisions? For example, an application that has more specific detail about what they're going to be doing in their project might feel, it might make you more confident in that project than another application, which has a general idea, but doesn't really have those specific details yet. So these are the kinds of things that you can kind of think from the reviewer's perspective and say, this is what's really going to make them feel confident about my project. You can also check the funder's website to see if the evaluation criteria is shared publicly. And if you can't find it, you can always reach out to a grants officer to see if that's something that they can share. We do share this information on our website. It's on each of the grants pages um, under the FAQs with a question on um, how is my application evaluated? So we do share that information and we're always happy to share that but it might be helpful to see how, how are my responses being evaluated so that you can kind of not write to them, but at least have it in mind as you're answering the questions. Um, and then finally, one thing that you may not know as you're filling out the application is that if a reviewer is really interested in your project but is missing some information, um, they might go to your website or to your social media to try to fill those gaps. So it's really important that your website and your social media, your public materials are as updated as possible because they might not be able to answer their question through your applications, yeah, but they can go to your website and What's see that? the answer there. Um, That's what I was trying. The question that way. So really a strong recommendation to make sure that not only anything that you're able to put publicly available is matching up to what's on your application or is available um, on your website and social media. Um, so we're going to be talking about some sections of our applications. We're not going to go through everything, um, but the sections of a typical CTH application include a project summary, and this is intended to be a public-facing um, summary of your project that's really short, um, a project case statement, and this is typically only in, um, required for our larger grants, 
and a project description. We'll talk about these three sections because they are different and uh, they have different purposes. They're not intended to have um, the same material copied over into them. So we wanna talk about what makes these, um, what, what makes a competitive answer to these sections. Um, for us as the Humanities Council uh, for Connecticut, it's also really important to identify your humanities themes and goals. So that's a question in all of our applications. Uh, we also ask about your subject matter expertise or community input. Um, and you will see that in our applications looking for more information about why did you select who you selected to be a part of this project? Um, who have you worked with as for a part of this project? Um, our larger grants require a schedule, what the grant period will look like for your project. Um, audience and marketing tends to be really important, identifying a specific target audience um, and how you're going to be marketing to that specific audience. Uh, your project team, who is working on this project. Your budget, um, and we have our template budget form, which we can help you with um, at draft review stages, and then also supporting attachments. So we're going to be mainly focusing on those first three and kind of talking about how you can be competitive with your project summary, case statement, and description. So we're going to start with the project summary. Um, I'm going to read these out loud to you. I have an example of a competitive answer and a not so competitive answer. Um, so the first one, the competitive answer, yeah, that's what I just said. the Pennington well, lecture is a public lecture on race and the power of the arts and humanities. The inaug inaugural lecture is by Sarah Lewis of Harvard on the evening of February 10th, 2022. This quick grant application is in support of two events leading up to the lecture. One, a public panel discussion on Lewis's book, The Rise, and two, a public breakfast address by Chris Weber, author of American to the Backbone, the biography of James Pennington, a prominent black abolitionist associated with Hartford. So this is really competitive for a few different reasons. It's succinct and to the point. You know, again, this is a summary. We want just kind of the key details here. This is meant to be public facing. This is something that if funded, we would use um, maybe in social media, in press releases, in our newsletters. Um, it also provides really important details. We know when this event will be happening and we know what will be happening at the events. There are two separate components to this uh, grant application and they've been named and they've been briefly described. Um, the not competitive answer simply says, we request funding for this year's Pennington lecture featuring a book discussion and author talk about race. Now the competitive answer is a real answer that was submitted via a grant that was successful, that was uh, funded by Connecticut Humanities. But we do see examples like the non-competitive answer sometimes. It doesn't give us a date, we don't know who's involved, um, and it doesn't go into any more detail about the book discussion or the author talk. Um, it, it names race as an important topic, but it doesn't go into any more detail about who, what, any of the, the important questions that might be asked that would really give a quick snapshot of it. So that project summary is really the first opportunity you have to introduce your project, um, not only publicly, but also to our reviewers. Um, next is your case statement. And again, this is really only for our larger projects. And the project case statement um, is really, as it says, where you're gonna make your case. Why should CTH fund this project? Um, so here, and it is in our question specifically, but we wanna highlight that it's really important to connect to funding priorities. Whether it's in the question for other funders or not, that most funders have funding priorities, and that's a really strong way to make your case. So connecting directly to the funding priorities, and for us, not only connecting your project to the funding priorities, but your organization's mission as well. So our funding priorities are fairly broad. You know, how how is your project, how is your organization's mission fitting into um, the humanities goals? and and the um, types of projects that we're seeking to fund um, as Scott read earlier in this presentation. Next is the project description. And this is really like the heart of a grant application. And there is a bit of a structure to it. Um, so you wanna provide some background um, to, to your description, to your project. How did you get here? What problems are you addressing? What led you to want to do this project? Um, but also follow that with what it is you actually wanna do. What are the, the, the schedule, if it, there's not a separate schedule section, but briefly outline what it is you're doing, 
when, who is involved, who are your experts involved, what those pro problems are that you're addressing, what are the solutions that you're coming up with? Um, and what is your process? Um, you know, if you're planning out, if you're still planning, how are you going to narrow down um, your options and make a final decision? Um, what does success look like for you? How will this project end? Um, if it's not ending during the grant period, how will it continue on? What um, what is the life cycle of this grant and your project? So a question we often get asked is how much detail is really needed? Um, you know, sometimes it, and I know for, for all of you who have written grants before, you know how time consuming it can be to fill out a grant application. Um, for us, our grants are typically a competitive process. So again, going back to thinking from the reviewer's perspective, how much detail do you need to give reviewers confidence in your project? Sometimes the level of detail really is the make or break factor when you're kind of on the cusp of the amount of funding that we have available. Um, we also, we know that projects evolve over time. So we know that for some projects, you're not going to have every single detail nailed out by the time you're filling out the grant application. So what information can you provide if your details are not yet confirmed? For example, if you have a lecture series and you don't know what the dates are yet, but you know you're aiming for Saturday evenings because that's the best time for your target audience, you can provide that detail, that's really helpful. Or if you don't know yet who your specific speaker is going to be, but you know that you've reached out to these two people and you're waiting to hear back, or you've reached out to three different universities and you have some leads and these are your leads and you're going to get more information by a certain date, all of this information is helpful for the reviewers to see what your process is, where you are in the process. And again, it's that level of detail that's giving the reviewers a little more confidence in your project. Um, you'll see for most grant applications, it'll tell you how much space you have for each question. We have a character limit on our questions. That doesn't mean that you have to use every single character for each question, but it kind of gives you an idea of how much detail the reviewers are expecting in each question. So make sure that you're using the space provided to your advantage. If it says you have 3,000 characters and you've put in 500 characters, you've probably not answered the question in a way that's competitive. So estimating about half, maybe a little more than half, is probably the amount of detail that is expected from that question as a, a minimum or as an average. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, and then finally, it's really better to be repetitive than it is to force reviewers to hunt for the relevant information. So even if you've mentioned something in one section and it's relevant to your answer to another section, it's fine to repeat that information. What we don't want is for reviewers to have read it, read something in one section, and then think, think about it in another section and think, where did I see that information and have to hunt through your application for that? So, you know, when in doubt, don't worry about being too repetitive. It would be better to be repetitive, granted that you're not copying and pasting the same answer in multiple questions, but it's better to be repetitive than to not have enough information. Don't assume. Um, you may have applied to this grant under many, many times and gotten grants over the years, but just because that's the case, the same people might not be reviewing your grants. You might have new um, people reading it for the first time they might not know about your organization. They might not know that this is a program that you've done uh, five years consecutively. Um, you know, tell people, assuming that they haven't heard about you, they don't know about your organization, they don't know about all that you do, they don't know this project. You know, same thing goes with abbreviations. Um, you know, we fall into this this pit ourselves, and in, in the work we do, we have to remember AASLH means the American Association for State and Local History. Um, the first time, you know, you say something, spell it out, then maybe you abbreviate after that, but don't just assume because it's a common thing that you use at your organization um, that everyone else is going to know what that abbreviation means. Um, and then again, don't assume that if you haven't told them something about your project and the work that you're doing here, that they're going to know that already. Start off assuming that they have not a single iota of what's going on in your project and what you're going to be doing, and that you have to be telling them that story from beginning to end. Don't jump in in chapter three and assume that they know chapters one and two because it's commonly understood uh, information. Uh, very similarly, talking about some missing information, um, make sure that you address all parts of each question. 
some of our questions have sub questions under them. So it's really important that you read the full question and you address the full question. And again, this goes back to thinking from the reviewer's perspective. Um, if you can take a look at what they're evaluating, you might be missing a chunk of what they're evaluating if you don't address all parts of the question. And that could kind of just be shooting yourself in the foot. Um, again, if you don't have specific answers to a question, don't ignore the question. Describe where you are in the process, describe as much information as you can, um, but don't just skip the question if you don't have that information. Um, what options are you considering? What's the process that you're using to make that decision? What's your anticipated timeline to make that decision? Again, all of that's really helpful for the reviewers, so don't just skip it, put as much as you can in there. So one of the uh, resources that we offer are sample grants. Um, they're available online, they're downloadable PDFs. Um, these are all from successful applicants. So these are applications that were funded and that we consider to be strong applications. Um, there are multiple samples per grant. Um, that way we can illustrate a variety of projects for each grant line. Um, so we recommend looking at these. So if, for example, if you're looking for a quick grant, not only do we have sample grants for quick grants, we have them for discussion-based programs. We have them for exhibits, for tours. Um, so we recommend going to look at the grant and looking at some of these applications, seeing what has been successful, what level of detail, um, what type of programming they offer, how they structured their programs, um, the connections to their experts. You should see all of that in that sample grant. Um, another resource that um, we offer is draft review. So, you know, ask for help. Oh, it always helps to ask for help. And as Scott detailed a little earlier, we, we do draft reviews for most of our grant lines, not for sponsorships, but we do offer them for quick grants, capacity planning and implementation. So what that looks like is you will, will put your, your application into our portal. Let us know that your application um, is ready. You'll save it instead of submitting it. We work in a queue system, so we'll let you know where in queue you are. And then we put feedback directly into the portal. So you can go in and look at each question and see feedback and comments and questions from us on each part of your application, including the budget. So we highly recommend that you take advantage of this. We do recommend coming to us at least two weeks before the deadline um, because of that queue system and because of how competitive the, um, the grants can be, how many applications we get. Um, but it also helps to have other people in your life take a look at it, have your colleagues look at it, people who are familiar with the project and have family and friends take a look at it. Um, people who might not be familiar with it. That way you get a set of eyes, just like a re uh, our reviewers don't know you in your projects. You have people who are unfamiliar with it who could give you some feedback. And finally, we understand that not all of your projects are gonna be a good fit for Connecticut Humanities. Um, that's why we've tried to tailor this to be about grant writing in general. We've developed a toolkit um, that is now on our website and it's um, to help you look at for opportunities with other funders. We have things um, like the Connecticut Office of the Arts, if you're more arts focused, the National Endowment for the Humanities, which have larger grants. Some of their grants are similar to ours, but they have a lot of grant options. Some of them are different than ours and um, they have different uh, funding opportunities. So there's a lot of different resources on there. Um, we encourage you to take a look, see if there might be a good fit for a project you're working on or considering. And with that, we're ready to take any questions that you might have. We will stop sharing the screen here and see what questions have popped up in the chat. Uh, do you want me to queue those up for you folks since we've been keeping an eye on it? Yeah, that would be great. We're just yeah. uh, scrolling up. So if, if you could queue those up, that would be great. Sure. Um, uh, there was a question from Christine. If the grant is for strategic planning, how do you talk about the ways in which that aligns with humanities themes and goals? Yeah, what so would your a, suggestions be? Yeah, a strategic planning um, project is going to come through our capacity grant line. And the question there is slightly different than humanities themes and goals. It's really asking, how does your organization bring the humanities to the public? And how will a capacity grant improve your ability to do so or increase your ability to do so. So if you're looking at strategic planning, you can talk about what your organization already does for the public humanities and how a strategic plan is going to help you to continue to do so, improve your ability to do so in the future. Yeah, I mean, all of our other grant lines, it's about your project. The capacity line is about you. 
So that's the important thing there is remember, we're not judging your project or any one project. We want to better understand who you are, what you're doing, what you want to be doing. Um, and that's going to be the key to success. Um, uh, there's a question from Avianca who asks, should we have the outline summary and case statement ready when we first reach out to you? Or, you know, should you have materials ready, um, kind of drafted prior to your first consult with a potential funder? It's not required to have those things drafted, um, but it might help you develop the questions that you might have about your project and about um, any questions you might have for us about the process. Um, so it would be a good way to think about where you are, what information you need. Um, Cause again, those are all of either the summary or kind of the heart of the application. Um, so starting a draft and just working through it to see where you're at and where you need to go might be a good idea. It certainly uh, wouldn't hurt and it could very possibly help you. Just don't become paralyzed by like feeling like you have to have everything figured out so that you wait so long in the process to contact us. That was my recommendation there. You know, if you know you're doing a lecture series, but you don't have all the authors figured out yet, that's fine. Let us know you're going to be doing a five-part series and the theme this year is going to be about the environment and here's where you're thinking you're going. Um, yeah. Just don't wait so long that, you know, you, you missed that opportunity to get, get a consult or especially to, to have a draft review. Yeah, and Eleanor said something similar in the chat, just indicating that um, the conversation and the consultation can really help you formulate and craft some of those early documents for your grant application itself. And, you know, in the example that Scott just sort of mentioned, you know, maybe CTH staff will have suggestions on people um, who might be good speakers for your series um, in that case. So um, thank you. Um, there's a question from the folks at IAIS um, on any, if whether you might be able to provide an example of a good versus a not so good case statement. I don't know if that's something that you folks can do off the cuff. Um, <laughs> we didn't want or if to you'd like to move on to something because, else. Yeah, we didn't want to put it on the slide because case statements do tend to be a little longer and that would have been crazy for you all to try to, to take a look at on the slide. Um, but like, um, like Becky mentioned, our website has examples of um, sample model grants and the ones for um, capacity planning implementation, those will have case statements. And so those you could find relevant examples for your project of good case statements there. Um, we don't have a ready example of a case statement that's not as good, but I think it would be really helpful to take a look at some of those samples and look at some of the good case statements there. Yeah, and even there, I mean, there's structures to all of these things. The case statement's going to have kind of three parts to it. You have to tell us a little bit about what you're doing there, a little bit more detail than you did in the previous section where you've only got a sentence or two. Then you want to match it up in our case, and like Leanne said to other funders, with their funding priorities, why does this matter? Why is it relevant right now? How is it helping the funder meet their priorities? And then and then close. If you can find some way to, to summarize and and really you know make make your your case stand, um, you know, then then, you, then people are excited. That's the whole goal here. If you want to get people excited, you want them to read more. You want them to be um, not having a bunch of questions. And if you can do that in your case statement, go, okay, now I want to fund this project. I want to know more about it. I want to attend this project. We've got a lot of times our reviewers get jazzed about some things and they're already marking it on their calendar wanting to go. You want to be the kind of project that they're reading where they're, they're, they're wanting to know more and they're wanting to go there. Um, Eleanor asked, what would you tell a quick grant grantee who's trying to decide if they're ready for a larger grant? How, I guess the question, the bigger question is here is like, if you've had some small grants in the past, how do you know that you're ready for kind of the next step, the larger grant, a more involved application, a different funder? Well, one thing is to take a look at our resources online. All of our grant applications are available as downloadable PDFs, just like the sample grants are. Um, so just preview that, see what is required, see how it's different from the quick grants that you've done. And that'll you know, give you an idea of what is different, what we might be looking for. Again, help you generate some of those questions and also have a conversation with us, talk us with us about your project. Because um, again, um, as we've mentioned, our projects are mostly, um, I'm sorry, our grants are mostly project-based. So you need to have a project for them and we'll help you determine if it's, if you're at the planning stage and you have a big planning project, is a planning grant appropriate for you? Is it something that will be competitive? Or are you beyond the planning grant stage and is implementation ready? Or is it a, 
you were thinking implementation, but it's actually kind of a smaller project and really quick grant is a better route to, to stick with. Um, we'll walk through that with you and help you find the best fit. Um, so I, my recommendation to sum up is to read the grants online, uh, the, the applications online and talk to us um, and we'll help you figure out that process. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it, it really is about what your project is. And like Becky said, you know, we can help you to see, especially if you've planned ahead, you have an idea of your budget. For example, I recently spoke to someone who was thinking about implementation for $10,000. Our implementation grants are much more competitive than our quick grants are. And quick grants go up to $4,999. So we took a look at the budget. We were really thinking, is it worth going for implementation versus quick grant? That's the type of conversation we can have with you as well. And, and don't think of it as a continuum as well. I mean, you there are many organizations that only are coming to us for quick grants. It's the right size grant for who they are and what they do. Um, you know, they do an annual spring lecture series. Um, there's a community read that happens every year at the same time. And that is the right size grant material application for the funding that they need. But, you know, if your organization were to do something different, you know, let's say you're a historic house and you've been coming to us for a lecture series, but you're going to be um, doing something bigger. You know, you want to transform um, your, your longer term exhibit in a way that might be the time to come to us and we might start to talk about, all right, well, yeah, we've, we've seen a track record. You've been doing great work. Now you've got a bigger need. Let's 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 talk about that planning grant to get you the, the research you need to do the more transformative, bigger project. Hey, thanks folks. Those are the three great dimensions to answering that question. Um, Nanette asks, I think this is just sort of a clarifying question. So um, you really suggest that we begin with an email to you or outreach to another potential funder to see if our idea is worth a grant to begin with, or I might add to Nanette's comment there, um, whether it's a good fit for uh, you as a funder. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, we we don't, what, we, what we're doing with the email and with the consult is we don't want you to end up wasting your time on something that is not going to be a good fit. So if you email us, and for example, if it's you have an idea for um, a project that's going to be a concert, and that's the whole project. We as the Humanities Council are unfortunately not able to fund concerts on their own because we fund humanities events, which would be the surrounding contextualization and interpretation um, of those concerts. And so we could let you know right then and there that as it stands, this doesn't seem like a fit for us. So that then you're not you know, taking too much time filling out an application before realizing that this may not be a fit. Or that you have the wrong grant line. I mean, there are sometimes that people are thinking this is a planning project and they realize it's not quite there. You're not planning to do a very specific humanities project, but you are doing consultant work to figure out what that project is going to be. And maybe you're at the capacity grant stage. And then before you go a whole bunch of a time down the wrong application and answering the wrong questions, we can quickly get you get you in the right place for the project work you're doing. Thanks. Um we had a question kind of about um, grant matching requirements. Um, if uh, Kim asked, if I have $10,000 committed from a private donor, can I list that as a match in two different applications? Um, you know, we're waiting to hear back on one. There's another funder who um, has a deadline next week. What are the sort of ethics around um, sort of what you can count as a match in multiple grant applications to different funders? I think I'd want to have more of a specific conversation about okay. what you're thinking of doing here and what's happening here. But in general, you know, if, if you're doing an exhibit and, um, you know, you've got that that donor going to give $5,000 to that exhibit, you know, you could match it in a grant to us. Sure. You could match it to a different funder who's also funding that exhibit because, you know, it's the same project and you're showing you've got value there. But I don't think you want to be, you know, telling one funder that you've got $5,000 from a donor to do an exhibit and a different you know, funder that you've got $5,000 to do a lecture series and you're going to hope that one becomes successful because at that point now you've got the same $5,000 spent on two different projects with two different funders. So I think you want to be figuring out where you want that money to be going and then you might be able to use the same funds as matches in different places. But again, we can get into more of the specifics um, on an individualized basis. Yeah. In the end, I feel like the answer to so many of these questions is Talk to your grants officer. Um, Cindy has a question. Um, are there any Connecticut humanities grants that do not require matching funds from other sources? And um, a sort of a follow-up question, do you have other funders that 
you might recommend that don't that you might point people to that don't have um, matching requirements? So most of our grant, all of our grants do require a match, but most of them don't require it from other funders. Um, we call that external match, like a donation or other grant sources. Um, implementation is the only grant line that requires those external funds as part of your match. The rest of our grant lines, um, we can use your own cash or in-kind donations. So your staff time and your salary time are some of the most common matches that we see. Um, so your internal cash um, and volunteer time are donated things like if somebody lets you use a room for free, you can use the cash value of that, that donated resource um, as part of your match. And I'll add that our sponsorships don't have any matching requirements. That's the one that doesn't have any match whatsoever. Um, I also will follow up with a common question we get is how much can I value my volunteers at? And we typically recommend if you look at what the AARP or IRS recommends, I believe right now it's a, around $30 an hour. It might be a little higher than that. And so that's a pretty standard um, amount that you can value a typical volunteer. If you have a volunteer that has really specialized, um, they're bringing something specialized to the project. For example, someone who would typically charge you know, $100 an hour or $150 an hour, don't devalue them. Use that amount if they're donating that time at that higher level. Yeah, and, and we're talking about our project grants here. So sponsorships don't require a match. You know, we're not talking about some of the grant lines we've had, like um, Good to Great or CT Summer at the Museum or operating support should that program come back. Again, some of those have no match or a very different match and requirements. Um, but, you know, even for the implementation grants, as Becky said, where a portion of your match is required to come from a third party for that same project, you don't have to have those funds in hand at the time of application. We require you to come up with the plan and tell us what the plan is at time of application. Um, but many times places use receipt of one of our grants as um, leverage to secure the outside funds that they need. And they'll go to the NEH or you'll go to an individual donor and say, hey, look, I just got this $20,000 implementation grant from Connecticut Humanities to do our exhibit. I need $5,000 of fundraising. Otherwise, I'm going to have to return the funds. Can you help us with that? Um, you do have to have the funds by the time you close out to be able to uh, fully receive your award. But you could use um, our grant as leverage to, to do some fundraising. Um, I'll add to, I'll throw the link in the chat for um, our grants toolkit, which Becky talked about. Um, and this is a toolkit that we've been, uh, that we continuously work on updating. It's not only funders, it also has other resources, but for projects that are not necessarily humanities projects, there are some, if you're in other related fields as well, um, this is a list of some other resources or funders that you might want to look at. Um, we don't have any specific ones to recommend regarding matching, but you might take a look at this and see if there are any that match up um, with your project. No pun intended. Um, you know, I, I, I think, and I don't know, um, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat um, just now, but we do have some time and we can open things up. But I'm wondering if you have, I mean, the question suggests to me sort of like ways that people should think or can think about matching requirements when it comes to grants. Like what is a match really saying to a potential funder? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the reason we've got some of the match requirements, they're not, we came up with them on our own. Our funding that comes to us from the state of Connecticut, and again, for our project grant lines, all the ones we're talking about today from sponsorship, quick grants, planning, implementation capacity, those all come to us through a line item. We've got language in our state budget that says, you know, for implementation grants above $5,000, you need to have this percentage external cash as part of your match. The state wants to see like a multiplier effect happen, that their dollars are generating other people to um, support your project as well. Um, but I think, you know, in general, as a, as a reviewer at Connecticut Humanities, for those that don't require external cash, you know, there are there is a question in the application, and this you, you will see in our, in our review matrix there, that if you're just meeting the one-to-one -one match all with volunteer time, it's meeting the minimal match. If you're throwing some of your own cash in, you've got one more point on, on a three-point scale. If you've got another funder that's kicking in some funds, that kind of gets you the, the maximum amount of points on that question because it's showing the funder that they're not the only ones investing in this project. You're not completely dependent on that funder to make the project successful or not. It won't make or break it, but that does get into conversation sometimes 
you know, th that, that you're asking us to fund $5,000 of a $5,000 project or 5,000 of a $25,000 project. Um, sometimes that gets taken into consideration of what level of support you have besides us as the only funder. Thank you for speaking to that. I think it's helpful to understand where these things come from as an applicant and also what they're telegraphing, right, um, to funders and the things that, um, you know, how fun how a funder is reading the work that you're preparing um, or the project that you're describing. So thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. So um, I want to open things up to folks to raise their hands um, uh, or see if there are any other um, things that we would like. I mean, we have the incredible resources of um, what we were calling before this meeting, um, kind of the CTH super group of grants staff here today. Um, and the point of the, this program and all of the programs that um, the league has been offering in partnership with CTH this fall are really focused on helping you, you know, be the best grant writers that you can and find great um sources of funds for the projects that you want to fund. Um, so does anybody have any other burning grants questions? How to, things you've struggled with in grant applications or questions that you have kind of about the broader process or about how funders see things? I will say just, just in general here, I mean, um, we as a funder and other funders are trying to find ways to be as accessible and, and, and not threatening, um, you know, so I think looking at it that way that your grant funder wants to find ways to have as many applications come in and to be successful and to be supporting organizations across the state. Um, and just because you haven't been successful with a grant funder before, or maybe it was many years ago, um, if you think you know that funder because you got a grant 20 years ago, um, check in with them again, see what's going on, check out their priorities, check out their website. Um, we're trying to get our grants to 169 Connecticut cities and towns. Um, and that's a priority for us. So if you're an organization that is one that hasn't gotten or hasn't gotten any grants in your town in a while, those things could work in your favor. Here's a question for you, Scott. How much trouble will I get into if I add jokes to a proposal? I mean, it depends on if the jokes are good or not, I guess, is the question here. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's, it's a storytelling aspect of grants here. So having some some personality, having a little bit of humor can be fun. Um, you know, the other thing here is like, if you're coming for a capacity grant, don't, don't be pulling back. Don't be making it sound like everything is rosy at your site if it's not rosy. If you want to be making a compelling case for why you need help right now and why your help should be prioritized against some of the others in there, you know, let people know the real situation. Trying to, you know, sugarcoat things is not always to your best success because it sounds like, I don't know why they're coming in for this. They sound like everything's pretty good over there. Whereas this place over here, man, they got some problems. We got to help them out. Um, so, you know, be discursive, be fun, but be honest. And, you know, Great. Good joke every once in a while isn't bad. Thanks. I mean, you know, the way I always think about it is like, you know, you want, you know, it's, I used to read, you know, college applications in a previous life. And like, you know, you notice when someone can say something that's a little bit different. Um, you know, obviously you wouldn't want to do anything like really crazy, <laughs> but, you know, I, I would imagine that those reading, if you're reading a stack of 25 applications, you know, things that you can do to give texture and personality and character to your proposal um, and make it memorable can only be, you know, for the good, I would imagine. Nanette has had her hand up. Nanette, please unmute yourself and oh. ask your question. Hi, everyone. Yes, I think we all want to know what can we do to get a grant? We know it's competitive. We've been turned down before. We all, I'm, I'm voicing what we're all not saying. Why did you fund them and not us? And so you want us to be very blunt. You want us to give detail about our project. But you want us to ask you, first of all, is our project a good fit for your grant? And is that correct? Because you're right. We we spend a lot of time uh, getting quotes, uh, you know, badgering people. Hey, I need this quote. I'm working on a grant. And then you get that. And then you have to go back and tell them, sorry, I didn't get the grant. So we're not going to do our project. So um, 
Well, how, how, how do we I get said. that edge? Um, go back to what I said earlier here. I mean, th this is yeah. the tough role of us as a as a grants officer. We want everyone to have the most competitive application that they can. We don't want to be giving bad advice. We don't want to be telling someone to come in for an implementation grant if it should have been a quick grant or a quick grant if it should have been a sponsorship or coming in for any grant if it shouldn't have come in at all. So we're always trying to be learning about what our, our, our grants committee is looking for and how the process is evolving here and giving the best information. Um, I guess being new or fairly new, I have a lot to learn. Well, I think, you know, I, I want Leanne and, and Becky to jump in here as well. You know, we're, we're trying to hear what your case is and give you the best information and say, all right, this is sound like a good fit or, you know, you know, take, take a step back. You know, sometimes maybe an organization needs a collections assessment or, um, uh, you know, would benefit from one of the other programs that one of our partner organizations offers to get you into the ability to have a more competitive application, get you more background information. And we're always trying to assess. And sometimes we assess right, and sometimes we don't assess right. Um, but we don't want places to feel like, man, I've tried three times in a row and I've gotten turned down. That is not what any of us want here. So we're going to have honest assessments, honest conversations. And we will tell places every once in a while, hey, look, you know, I thought this was going to be something that was competitive. We worked on it. It's just it's just not working right now. The grants committee has got these concerns or these questions, um, and we wouldn't recommend coming in right now for this project or for a different project. And we'll, we're, we're always trying to be um, figuring out the best advice to give at any time. Okay. Yeah, okay, I mean, I, I would say we, of course, can't guarantee that anyone is going to get a grant. Oh, I know, I know. What we're doing is, you know, trying to to interpret what we've seen from the past and the trends that we've seen and, and what we think the committee is really going to respond to and help you to make sure you're putting as much information as you can that will get that reaction from the committee that we want. Um, but for us at CTH, what we do is um, not only the, the consult and the draft reviews, but also if the committee has feedback and they choose not to fund your proposal, we do have a conversation with you. We wanna talk through, here's exactly what they talked about, Sometimes it's things that maybe you can make some changes and come back again. Like Scott said, sometimes, you know, we, we don't want to have you jump through, you know, hoops again if the result is going to be the same. So we try to be blunt with you as well with what we hear from the committee. And we, we're kind of trying to translate, you know, back and forth between the, the committee and, and with the grant writers. Well, and, and another thing I would say here is, is listen to the grant officer and the feedback that you're getting. And this is not for, for you, but just in general, some things that we, we see and we hear will be like, if we have a co consult and we say, I don't recommend coming in for a grant. It doesn't seem like it is going to be um, competitive. You can do so, but I wouldn't recommend it. At that point, that's a pretty clear thing that we say to someone, but sometimes they, they decide to apply anyway. And we'll be like, I don't know. We tried to tell them it's not going to work. It didn't work, but they came in anyway. Or, you know, when we do a draft review, we will go through and we will look at your different sections and we will get very specific feedback. Now, when we see the same grant come in, literally like it was before all the feedback without addressing any of those questions or concerns, that's another thing here. Like we, we tried to give you the best tips and sometimes, many times, places will listen to them, follow them, work on them. But there are times where you say, I don't know why I spent all this time giving all this feedback. They didn't, they didn't listen to any of it. They just submitted it as it was. Those inevitably are the grants that aren't successful. So listen to what we say, try to follow the, the advice we're giving. Um, and if you're asking us for our time, you know, please, you know, respond to it, especially with the draft, and don't just submit the grant like it was before before the grant office took their time. Thank you. Th yeah, and th thanks for that question, And uh, There's a great conversation sort of side conversation going on in the chat that I just want to flag here as well about um like it rejection can be totally deflating <laughs> right i mean exactly. you work so hard on something yes. um you know and it can be really hard to like pick yourself up and go back to the people who just said nope to you and say how could we make this better but right. i think rare is the funder who would not want to give you feedback if you asked for it um because the whole like you know they're job is to help connect you with the funding that they offer um, and help you improve your application. So, you know, it's, it's like with 
academic publishing, unless you're getting what, you know, the kind of like clear, this isn't a good fit, we don't suggest you apply message, you know, there's a revise and resubmit basically kind of options. And the thing that you can do is really work with any grants officer, you know, whoever the funder is, to get that feedback to strengthen the application the next time around. Um, and it's it can be hard to do that, but I think the, the results are better and you'll probably feel better about your relationship with that funder if you are able to have that conversation too. And I'm not sure who's all on, on, on the call today here, but like there have been folks that have said, you know, I was really mad when you guys didn't fund our proposal and had some suggestions, but you know, the suggestions you made made for a better project. And, you know, I'm glad in, in, at the end of the day that, you know, we didn't get it the first time around. I think we ended up with something that was better as, as a result. So I, we have had some places that have had those conversations with us. We've had other places that we've called up and said, hey, you didn't get the, get the grant. Like, oh, thank God we didn't want to do the project. So, you know, there's there's all kinds <laughs> of things. But no matter what happens, please be respectful of your grant officers. I don't know what's going on, but over the last bit of time, we've had some people that gotten a little bit testy. And, you know, we're, we're not we're not the people that are reviewing your grants. We're not the ones making decisions. We're that, that tennis official trying to be giving you the best advice and, and be giving the committee the best grants. So please be respectful and, and, and don't start, you know, yelling at us or, or slamming the phone down and hanging up on us when we're trying to, again, give you the part of our job that's the feedback that'll help you um, have successful projects, whether you come back to us or not. Um, I just want to make sure we don't, um, I know we're running out of time, that we answer Melanie's question. Yes, that's here. thank you, Leanne. I was going to get yeah. to that next. Uh, Melanie had a question about filling out budgets, if there's help that that we can offer. Um, that's something we strongly recommend for draft reviews, that you have a draft of your budget and we can go through and say, you know, we not only check to make sure that it's filled out correctly, but we can also say, you know, you had $200 here for per diem. Is that food? Because we can't pay for that. You know, so we we check it against our um, our guidelines as well. I literally read a draft budget today where I'm like, hey, shift out that $5,000 for, for meals. We can't do that. And that's a big shift in grant. Thank you. Um, so yeah, N Nanette is trying to clarify here. So, um, and, and this is the case. Yeah, so the grants team at Connecticut Humanities does not make decisions about the grants. No. They're there to, yeah, go we, ahead, Scott. We have grants that are reviewed completely by our application review committee, which again is comprised of board members and outside subject area specialists. We have other grant lines where some staff does participate in the review process. None of the three of us are voting on any of those. Um, we are either running the meeting, we are the people that are counseling you, so we want to be removed from the ones that are voting on. Um, none of the three of us are voting on any of your grants for the competitive grant lines. And that's such an important clarification, I think. Um, I want to, I want to, we have one more minute and I just want to say there's a lot of love happening in the chat for the CTH grants team. Um, and I want to add to that um, because we're all really um, just fortunate to have your time today um, to really help everyone in this Zoom room think, um, think about the grant application process and really um, the aspects that make a strong grant application, whether it's for Connecticut Humanities or not. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the really important take homes are like, do your homework, read the funding opportunity announcement what, from whatever funder and talk to your grants officer um, because they will have ideas and thoughts and suggestions that can make a, make for a stronger proposal. Yeah. I wanna yeah. um, apologize, oh, go ahead, Scott. I'm sorry, go ahead. And just, you know, have a second set of eyes. This was on one of the slides. Yeah, We all work in vacuums and it's always great whether it be a colleague, another board member, your mom, have them read it, give some feedback because they're going to have some questions. And if they have got questions, the reviewers are going to have questions. Yeah, that's what you always said, right? You know, like when you're, I was remember, you know, any writing project that I had worked on when I was in school, it's like, you know, have another person read it and you'll see like, are you making your points or are you still too inside your own head or your own world? Can it be legible to someone who's not at all familiar with you or your organization or the work that you're doing? Um, it's so important. Um, Dan in the chat says, you, you at Connecticut Humanities have had a tremendous effect on our organization and our community. Thank you. There's a lot of love happening for CTH in the chat here. So um, without further ado, I want to thank um, 
the three of you, Scott, Leanne, and Becky, for being here. Um, to Emily for all her hard work in working with the grant staff and putting together this program. Um, I want to apologize for the link issues that I know many of you experienced. Um, Emily and I are working on um, pinpointing the source of that error. Um, and I'm so glad you were able to join us today. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up message with the recording and all of the resources and slides. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.